Welcome to the first interview in the Europe Direct Blanchard Sound series, Celebrating Women Entrepreneurs. In this first interview, I spoke to Jill Barrett. Jill is a business and employment coach who's a regular contributor to Europe Direct interviews and events. In this interview, we discuss some of the main challenges faced by women entrepreneurs. Welcome, Jill, and thank you for joining us. You, you're a good friend of Europe Direct, and it's great to see you again. Delighted to be here, Barry, and thanks very much for asking me. Um, loving the opportunity, so thank you. So, um, we're talking this week about women entrepreneurs, and specifically, we want to celebrate women entrepreneurs. And, and you've spoken about this with us a lot in the past. You've done lots of business-themed events. So just give us just a quick introduction to your own background in entrepreneurship. Yeah, so I, I suppose I started a business um, called The Head Coach in, uh, I suppose, in parallel with uh, just a full time job that I was doing. And the way I, I got into that was it, I sort of fell into it. And I suppose I never would have thought of myself as an entrepreneur, only retrospectively, I suppose, after I got into it, realized that I was. Um, and that sort of reminds us that entrepreneurship can come in many forms. Sometimes people then go up. You know, do I really want to start my own business, particularly women, because women tend to have a lot of responsibilities or take on a lot of responsibilities. We'll talk more about that as the session goes on. Um, but, you know, it can be either be starting a business, which is obviously employing other people, um, you know, but we forget about the notion of just working, purely working for ourselves or perhaps taking on a franchise. So sharing the responsibility or maybe entrepreneurship also as growing a business. So if you look at the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Awards, you'll see a lot of people who've gone in and like Joanna Gardner. Would be an example. Um, it used to be Emulave, now Elav. Um, a lot of, of, of uh, women will be familiar with that. Growing a business from start. So I fell into it. I literally I was just working full time in another job, and uh, somebody just asked me, would I coach uh, a colleague, or sorry, not coach a colleague, coach a for a colleague that was just stuck with a client. And I went in, you know, coached her. It went really well. She asked me back to coach her a few more times. And then she started just referring me on to other people. And that was how that side of the business grew. And then in my full time job as well, I was, you know, trained in a particular it was Myers Briggs at the time. And the guy who was delivering the training went, Do you know what? You seem to have, you know, you've just got a sense for this. Why don't you come and work uh, for me with me? Do you know what I mean? So I built. I suppose a business around of that um, in terms of working for myself. So, um, so yeah, I suppose it's, it's to open up the idea to people that you don't have to sort of jump straight in and be employing, you know, 50 people overnight or even, uh, you know, the small to medium enterprise type. You, you can start very small and build it up. I mean, you mentioned challenges and I think that's a big part about what we're going to talk about today and, and the particular challenges that women face that, that often many men don't face in particular yeah. and, and one of the first thing I want to talk to you about is mindset sure and and why like why is it particularly important for women in business who are starting out what what is it about mindset that you mentioned this already about work-life balance and challenges could you talk to me a little bit about that yeah, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about delegation in a while. I suppose mindset is really important, um, and it's not just for, you know, women or men. It's for everybody. Um, and I know today, obviously as well, just we're thinking about uh, women as being minority entrepreneurs, if you like, um, because we live in a sort of a non-binary world. So, um, you know, today we're focusing on on women in that sort of subset. Um, and uh, mindset is really important. I mean, if what's going on between the ears is right. Um, and also, I suppose, head and heart. So we're not to rule out our emotions as well. But in terms of our mind and our thinking, that's really important. And to be in a really positive, uh, and when I say positive frame of mind, is in a healthy frame of mind is good. Um, there's a, you know, anybody watching or listening will be familiar with Carol Dweck. You know, she, you know, uh, the sort of growth mindset idea, the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, i.e., no matter what your background in life, no matter what your experience, you know, your upbringing, your knowledge, whatever, you can turn things around at any time. And that's the idea that, you know, you can develop that, that mindset. Simon Sinek, I suppose, is another guy who talks about the why. I mean, if you don't know why you're starting a business or what you want to do, that's your challenge, isn't it? Um, I remember attending a, a workshop with a great uh, sort of performance psychologist, a sports guy called uh, endurance athlete, Jerry Hussey, and uh, not Jerry Duffy, the other one, there's two Jerry's, and um, both of them excellent, but uh, Jerry Hussey, and he was talking about the notion of, you know, what what's the fire in your belly? You know what I mean? Because once you have a drive to create something or to, you know, be a, whether you're a social entrepreneur or a commercial entrepreneur, you know, what's the thing that would have you jumping out of bed every day to do it? And if you talk to entrepreneurs, like I work a lot with, uh, so serial entrepreneurs, I do a lot of entrepreneurship workshops myself. 
Um, and the thing that's in common, I always find is one, uh, they have great ideas, but once the idea becomes boring or whatever, they're on to the next thing. And the the thrill is the startup, all the challenges of the startup of getting something going. Once it's sort of flowing, then, you know, the brain switches off a little bit. So it's really um, important mindset. And to get into your mind, uh, Barry, that you are unstoppable. And, you know, a lot of us are, are, are challenged by that. And we're going to talk about sort of gender specific things, I suppose, in business um, shortly. But, you know, get into the mindset that you can do anything. Um, you know, and I, you know, with my own coach, who's male, um, an ex, ex monster rugby player, I just have, I've, I've, I've structured that very well. Um, but he's great. He, he says, Jill, you have to be able to be so focused and so driven that you can keep going no matter what's happening in your life, whether the world is falling down around you to keep going. So you might be sick, you're somebody in your family might be sick uh, or dying do you know what I mean it's, it's that extreme you you have to really get yourself into that mindset that no matter what's happening you can keep going it's about focus and discipline um he recommended two books to me one is the obstacle is the way Ryan Holiday and the other was uh, deep work at Cal Newport <laughs> um I'm not fully through the obstacle is the way maybe that's the obstacle but um, but the deep work is really important and it's about getting really, really driven about what you want to do, getting yourself into the, the right frame of mind. Um, and, you know, I used to listen to things like Tony Robbins. Now, people might feel different things about Tony Robbins. Some people love him. Some people hate him. You know, I don't think anybody's sort of in, you know, in between. But whatever it takes to get you up and get you motivated. So you need to have the fire in your belly for whatever it is you want to do. But there's going to be down days. Um, like I have a playlist and I have um, I have um, routines and rituals that I do every day. And the only day, the, the day that they'll all stop, Barry, is if I'm just too sick to do them. If I was in a coma or if I'm dead, when I die, that'll stop. But onto that, like I have a song every morning that gets me out of bed. And it's usually Lady Gaga, Edge of Glory. It just comes into my head first thing so I've done my meditation I've done my mindfulness I've said my prayers because I'm a bit of a spiritual bunny not religious just spiritual I pray to the universe you know I do my diaphragmatic breathing and um, I do a bit of yoga as in meditation yoga in the bed if if time allows if not you know I'll do a short one and then I'll, I'll, I might come back to it later and um, but then I literally jump out of the bed and I do like a quick interval workout it's only 10 minutes to and it's always starts nearly with edge of glory or if I need a, a little bit of motivation new radicals you only get what you give um and other ones you know Natasha Bedingfield is a great song on written I'm a bit of a rock and a pop chick um so but whatever motivates you and gets you going is you know if you're feeling because we're not feeling great our, our mind you know 100% of the time uh, we're not happy and upbeat 100% of the time sometimes we are and I might seem like that I'm a bit wired always when I'm doing these things with you <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, listen, I think it's a great Your thing. Fault, and, and, no, it's my fault, of course. Yeah, we're, we're yeah. talking about mindset, obviously. And, and yeah. you, you spoke about confidence and, and sometimes not feeling great. Yeah. And, you, you know, running a business is is, is difficult. It's, yes. it's a hard task. And, and there's, a, there's a, a term I've come across before. And that term is imposter syndrome. Mm. Now, I want you to maybe start by just maybe explaining what imposter syndrome actually means give a definition and then is it true do you think that women would experience imposter syndrome more than men and is is it particular to any type of personality okay well i'll take those in reverse order so um they have done research and studies um and uh i was at a workshop recently actually and they'd had the exact statistic but i can't remember what it was but it was only very marginal um, like most men, you know, who experience exposter syndrome, the, the difference that the, the margin between the number of women that experience it and the number of men that is terribly tiny. Do you know what I mean? So it's actually, you think, I suppose, look, uh, appearance wise, men look like they're more confident. I don't know whether, you know, you as a self-professed, you know, male can, um, yeah. you know, say, look, I, I often feel more confident that I am, but but that's like if you have frank conversations and I get to have those conversations with guys a lot of the time because I'm in and, we, and we've had that conversation, Jill. I, I, I said to you the last time we spoke, it was like doing a therapy session, but a therapy session that was put on YouTube for all to see. <laughs> and, and, and we discuss things like that. Absolutely. So you're right. Yeah. I think everything um, suffers from it. Yeah. So so it's not peculiar to women. It's just there's a slight margin of, you know, 
increase in terms of whether women experience or men experience, but, but we all experience it. Um, I love the quote from Sheryl Sandberg, um, who sort of, you know, you, you see her as sort of a high flying businesswoman. And she just says, look, there are still days that I wake up feeling like a fraud, you know, not sure that I should be where I am. So, I mean, if it happens at that sort of level, you know what I mean? We can experience, we, we, we know why it's, uh, and that I think that, that expression, you know, feeling like a fraud, feeling I shouldn't be where I am, I'm not, you know, how 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 did I get to be in this position? You know, um, God, when they find out, you know, my dad had a great expression. I think I've mentioned it before. He used to say, Chili, at the interview, tell them you know everything. By the time they find out that you didn't, you will. You know, and I just think it's a great motto for life. You know, tell them you know everything. And, you know, we want to be authentic. We do don't want to be pretending um, that we can do things we can't do okay uh, as in, you know we want to we want to sort of put our hands up uh, and that's what not being an imposter is about i think imposter syndrome sometimes if you think of it in this sort of reverse way you know we experience imposter syndrome and then we try to create a version of ourselves based on our perception of ourselves which is not us and that's the imposter do you know what i mean trying to be something we're not instead of going look I don't have all the answers. Oh my God, I can't believe we ran out of that. That's totally my fault. Like you have to put your hand up, but um, we it, it's you'll you'll know it in yourself if you tend to be very critical of yourself. You're running yourself down. You have what uh, we used to call in a in a job that I worked in. We used to call it helper syndrome. Uh, somebody would you know be asking for something and suddenly everybody's up looking for it. You know what I mean? Um, instead of just leaving the person to find it for themselves, you know what I mean? You're helping people all the time. The what I call Roy Keenism. Uh, Roy Keen, you know, is famous for not being able to celebrate the big wins, whatever, never being satisfied with what everybody else perceives as 100%. Um, you know what I mean? He's, he's driving for more instead of just celebrating the moment. Um, so once you've spotted it, you know, just to say, look, we have to get over ourselves. Um, you know, we really are as good as people you know, think we are sometimes, you know what I mean? Sometimes we're not. Rory Best said it lovely, um, beautifully, more, much more articulately than I would, but to, to paraphrase him, he said, look, you know, we're never as good or as bad as somebody thinks we are, you know, and it, it's about finding that happy medium because we, we tend to default the taking the poor stuff or assuming the poor stuff, you know what I mean? Or the, the bad thoughts about it, or, the, you know, people are talking saying, oh, geez, she's not up to the job or she's not able to start her own business. But we don't take the, you know, the, it's called the leaky container. You know what I mean? Imagine a lunchbox and all the positive things that people are saying, look, do you know what? You're a great leader. You've got a great idea. You, you're really enthusiastic. You're good with people. You know, you're great at reaching out for help when, you know what I mean? You need to fill the gaps. Um, and then somebody goes, oh, do you know what? I don't think you're up to this at all. And suddenly all the stuff, the leaky container, you know, it's like sand is the good stuff or the bad stuff and the water is the bad stuff. There's holes in the bottom of the container. All the good stuff has gone straight through. And this just one comment is left in the box. And that's what you focus on. So again, getting over yourselves. Um, yeah. yeah. And just, uh, yeah, I suppose don't, you know, be a sort of a slave to your, to your mind and your brain. You know what I mean? It, it really is about being real being honest with yourself you know don't no comparing and um, talk about your feelings help others ask for feedback and um, you know take steps in the right direction uh you know what i mean and stop comparing the comparison very particularly in business is just you know it's 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 ruthless absolutely uh ruth or sorry ruthless it's it's just so destructive to yourself Think that the only person you should maybe compare yourself is to yourself yesterday you know exactly uh, exactly that's it and, and i was yeah. going to say there i mean you say about we, we we spoke about this before we have a terrible tendency to focus on the negative if somebody says one one negative comment you know yourself if you, yeah. you get reviews for a business you'll get yeah. 50 great reviews and it's the one bad one that you'll be thinking about and i think irish people in particular were very bad at taking compliments <laughs> we're yeah, not good to... i don't and i don't think it's exclusive um probably because i work with just in a very multicultural environments with people it's definitely not exclusive to Ireland I think it's it is it is present in Ireland and um, like I hear like you know people say oh you know <laughs> if you think of the British conquering the world do you know what I mean like I they're very self-deprecating they're very sort of running themselves down sometimes people see it as a form of politeness almost you know so um and sometimes it's a cultural thing again you know the oppressed nations as well so the 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 um yeah culturally it, there's there's definitely an issue there yeah 
I'm going to move on to another major challenge uh, that, I mean, can face men and women, but I think historically has mainly faced women, and that's work-life balance. Uh, my own sister, who, who will be featured in this series, she's a photographer, uh, will, will be talking about this, her personal uh, experience. Uh, is work-life balance one of the biggest challenges for, for female entrepreneurs? And, and what advice could you give women who are trying to manage their personal life with business life? Absolutely. I mean, you know, biologically, women, we are the caregivers. Do you know what I mean? We're the, the natural caregivers. But there's also, uh, I suppose, an element of self-responsibility in this <clears throat> and just um, figuring out what you can do and what you can delegate. So I always say you make a list of everything that needs to be done. You say what needs to be done. OK, second thing you do is what really needs to be done, because everything doesn't need to be done. You'll discover um, particularly if you're thinking about family life and home and whatever so you're thinking about what are the staples and uh, and what what needs to happen and if it's for other people as in you know looking after the home looking after the bills looking after other children or it's just, sorry, your children or uh, or others or whatever you know who else can do that um you know and and then asking them uh you know that is the the, the most important um thing because if you for example you know just take everything on yourself you know, then you become like we we used to call it. Uh, myself and a couple of female friends used to call it like sort of as I said, I said helper syndrome earlier. You become the martyr. You know, um, one of the most freeing things that was ever said to me was, "Do you think that if you don't do that, the world is going to stop turning?" Yeah, and I went, oh, I was indignant. I, I was just. Can you believe? I can't. You know, like, and in my head, obviously, who do you think you are? Do you know what I mean? I wasn't sort of. Uh, and what I, I tend to do is I just internalize stuff, and then I'd explode later. You know, um. But but I was just disgusted. But it was the most freeing thing that anybody ever said because I realized, oh, good point. I'm the one choosing to do this. I'm the one choosing to literally bend over backwards to try and make everything happen, bringing people to appointments, you know, running here, running there. I thought, all I need to do is stop doing it and then somebody else will take over. And the interesting thing that um, you'll find, Barry, when, when, when we stop doing stuff, somebody else, you know, we, there's an expression which nature abhors a vacuum, okay? So somebody else will step in or something else will step in to fill in the void. When we think, you know, and it's important to our self-esteem to do everything. We keep the accelerator down. We keep doing it. And there's an expression which says, if you want something done, ask a busy person. OK. Um, and the same goes for if you want something done, ask somebody whose self-esteem or self-worth is tied to doing stuff for you and for everybody else. Yeah. Um, there's a guy called Gabor Mate. Um, and with all these people I'm recommending that you read or listen to or whatever, you know, you take everything with a pinch of salt, the healthy pinch of salt, take what's useful, leave what's um, what's not. He talks about trauma and he talks about women who have died and the eulogies, you know, of women, particularly women who experience like difficult illnesses or long illnesses like cancer. And you hear people say, oh, you know, God, she she bore it so well and she looked after everybody and she never complained. And she, do you know, <laughs> and you're like, well, maybe if she had. Do you know what I mean? She, or maybe if she hadn't cared for everybody else, and maybe, do you know what I mean? She might have been in a better place herself. So really important to think about that. My sister also, um, when I was growing up, my mum uh, wasn't very well. So uh, it was my dad and myself um, and my my three siblings left. They were a good bit older than me. So they, they left um, the home in, in turn, leaving me behind to sort of look after things. And I remember my sister coming home from England one weekend and she went, why are you? Why are you ironing X, Y, and Z? She goes, stop ironing the underwear, stop ironing the duvets, stop the pillowcases that, you know, you know, Jill, and anything you can hang up, just when I went, completely. Do you know what I mean? Completely. So in terms of delegation, you know, what are you doing that is not necessary? Um, they always say, you know, uh, coming back to ironing as a theme, your children will never remember that you ironed their clothes. They will remember the times that you spent with them you know um so Eckhart Tolle has a great expression he goes you know what is the quality of your doing what is the quality of our doing and we can all be busy fools you know what I mean running around headless chickens thinking we're getting loads done what are you getting done of stuff that's important because we're here for a good time not for a long time you know what I mean so in terms of looking back on your life and what counted you know make sure that every second of every minute of every day as much as possible counts
quality over quantity, really, isn't it, uh, in terms of tasks as well? You know, sorry, I'm sorry, I just lost you there, actually. You lost me there. Okay, no problem. I said it was quality over quantity seems to be the what, what I've, I've gotten out of that, you know, that rather than doing lots of things, maybe poorly, do a few things well, or important things, I suppose, as you 100%. said. Yeah, yeah so ju just to move on from that, um, would you say it, it, it's, it's fair to say that some women entrepreneurs might find it more difficult to get their ideas and opinions taken seriously? And why might this be the case? I think one of the reasons, um, in my experience, and again, I'm only going from my experience, um, sorry, and I, I, I'm a bit of an alpha female, so I, I'm lucky in a way. <laughs> Yeah. Do you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a scary person when I get going because I'm quite driven uh, as an internal. I'm quite enthusiastic. I work in coaching and training and I suppose because I've come through a lot of, I suppose, challenges in my own life. And I suppose I've, you know, both from a professional perspective and a personal perspective. And I've just realized that, you know, and I, I was I was thinking about this earlier, actually. I talked about my dad a lot today and I realized my dad was actually my first coach, even though I didn't realize it at the time, but also that I, I was looking back through a, a folder recently and it was just a piece of work I had done and I was going through a very difficult uh, time in my life at the time and I was going, how did I do that? You know what I mean? The, the level of organization, the level of intricacy of detail, and I'm not a good detail person, I can assure you, um, you know, just I thought how did I actually get through all that and it's it's realizing um that you know you just literally you just have to get up and get on with it and that's not a bad thing so this notion I, I notice a lot of women apologizing or focusing on what they perceive as their faults and we talked about imposter syndrome earlier um and it really struck me I was watching a uh, panel interview with uh this is before lockdown, uh, four women. So there was a host was a female and they just happened to be all that. I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't a female or a women's event. It was just that they all happened to be female. And every one of them in turn, even the host apologized for something, said, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, uh, you know, forgive me for whatever. Or, you know, uh, you know, just focusing on their shortcomings. And I just thought, why are you doing that? Do you know, why are you? drawing attention to what you perceive is a fault or something that's not good enough in you. So I always say, uh, and, and here's the cultural thing, it definitely is an Irish thing. To, well, I thought it was an Irish thing to say sorry. And then I remember, um, I think it was an Indian student going, uh, no, we, we do that too. And then, you know, a Polish girl going, no, we do that too. And I was like, okay, it's obviously, you know, different cultures or whatever, but we often say, say sorry um, when there's nothing to be sorry about. And sorry is a funny little word. Um, you know, if, if we, again, I've spoken about this before, you know, in terms of, of, of yourself, Google is listening. Um, we always say like, you know, if you look at your, your, your device, Google is listening and Google is, imagine that's your brain. Your brain is listening and your brain is paying attention to whatever you say. And the more we focus, whatever we focus on becomes our reality. Mm -hmm. So if I'm saying sorry and apologizing for myself all the time, downgrading or, you know, deriding myself all the time in my head or verbally to other people, then that's what's going to happen. I'm going to become that person. So I just say, just stop it. You know, say sorry if you've done something really wrong to somebody or about somebody or in business or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely apologize. But, you know, remove the word from your vocabulary. Um, not saying you're sorry all the time doesn't mean you're not a nice person. OK, um, and it doesn't mean, you know, you are an alpha male if you don't want or an alpha female if you don't want to be a female. It doesn't mean you're not kind. It just means you stop saying sorry. Um, one exception to that, obviously, in business, emotional intelligence is useful. So this is a bit Machiavellian. But if you think that saying sorry and it's important sometimes in conflict, even if if you're not the person in the wrong, just to say it to deflate the situation, you know, um, or if you're in a difficult negotiation with a client or whatever, you know what I mean? You think, gosh, I need to wheel this back a little bit. You just say you're sorry, straight and straight and simple. But but when I say apologizing, I mean stop apologizing for yourself and your way of being. Um, you know, I say the cultures that we often have, we veer towards um, I suppose the oppressed or the polite, you know, um, or one or the other, you know what I mean? And and sorry seems to be a, a way of, of of being for some uh, women in particular. So affirmations are very good for coming, uh, for overcoming that. Um, but if it's something that you need, you know, you say, gosh, 
yeah, I know where that's coming from. And it's to do with my self-esteem or my self-confidence. Self-esteem is the root of your self-confidence, really. We can we can fake it a lot of the time, but if we don't really believe it, um, you know, we need to work on ourselves there. And that's where the coaching piece and a lot of my work, um, particularly with with women or with people who are just lacking confidence, be they women, men or any any gender or none, um, it tends to be around that just starting to look at and examine where is that coming from? Why do I feel you know, I need to be apologizing for myself and leads into that imposter syndrome as well. There's a very fine line between arrogance, arrogance and confidence, you know, and if you see the kids of today, um, you know, people will go, God, there's no shortage of confidence there. But it's actually it's very loosely constructed, you know, usually around social media and whatever or bravado. Um, and, you know, they call them the, you know, the, the chocolate cups really do you know what I mean? You pour the hot water in and, and it all comes askew. So, yeah. Um, so most of us have no, uh, certainly, you know, if if uh, indigenous Irish and females, uh, do you know what I mean? There's there's no fear of being arrogant, really, m- most of the time. You know what I mean? In my experience, yeah. it's not something that we suffer from. And it's interesting that you're talking about kind of self-image, self-confidence, and it kind of brings me to the question of image. And we, we had a discussion in the in the office here the other day about that, that like a male politician will go out and no one will ever really take any note of his appearance, where often with women politicians, it will be noticed what she's wearing. And this, I think the same applies for the business world. As I said, if a male business owner walks into a room, almost... 99% of the time, nobody will comment on their appearance. Um, whereas that's not necessarily the case with a woman. And do you, do you think women get a rough deal on this? Yeah, usually from other women, to be honest. Okay. You know, I don't know if that was is something that, that that people would agree with, but I think it's usually by other women. I always say, um, you know, if you think of a politician, think of Angela Merkel, who... Uh, that's who we yeah. were talking about, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and like that's a sort of a famous one. Do you know what I mean? Around her having a stylist who just has a certain set of jackets and clothes and she just wears the same thing, slightly tweaked over and over again. And um, so I always say, unless image is your business, this is a this could be a controversial one. People go, oh, who does she think she is? And I, I'm not intending like I'm not an image guru. And my hair, like even as I'm talking to you, I'm going, geez, my hair is all over the shop uh, today, you know, because uh, and it is a remarkable thing about me. And other women will go to Jill, would you use a straightener? Or would you do this or would you do that? And I'm going, look, it's really irrelevant. It's really irrelevant to what I'm doing. Am I neat? Am I tidy? Am I presentable? So I would say unless image is your business, you know, I think of um, uh, there's a couple of programs on the telly at the moment, you know, sort of, uh, you know, when you're feeling very, you know, tired, Barry, you might like to watch these yourselves. You know, it's where uh, they take somebody and then they dress them up. Do you know what I mean? And they uh, yes. you know, can't even remember the name of them. But <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But if that's your business, then you want to be looking a hundred million dollars all the time and, you know, a beautiful clothes and your beautiful hair and, you know, nails done different ways and be bang on trend and all of that. But unless your image is your business, just focus on being neat and tidy, being understated. Your image really should be the most unremarkable thing. That's the part of your business presentation or your, you know, relationship with building other people. It's a bit. I always say as as well. It's a bit like going to a wedding. Like you know, we don't want to be so remarkable that we take the spotlight off the bride. You know, the most important um, things in the room when you are building a business, starting a business, negotiating for investment, whatever it is, is your business idea you know, the, the the concept that you have and the other person, a f- complete focus on the other person. If you're, because your dress can be distracting. I, I um, and, and, and you have experience of France as well. You know, I spent uh, lucky, t- you know, time in, in college, seven months in France, fantastic. And I just noticed, you know, French women in particular, always very understated elegance you know what I mean and even I look now like their nails are never a million at least the, the women that I know and the French women that I come across never a million different colors and like three inches long do you know what I mean always neat buffed whatever so it's, it's unremarkable they just have style but it's not in your face you know so I suppose it's just if you want to be taken seriously don't make your your look unless again unless it's your business don't make your look the most important thing in the room or the most distracting thing in the room you know that that's what we'd say about image that's 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 really interesting yeah and, and we, we were talking I can count on about 
one handy amount of times a, a man's appearance was brought up. I think I can remember Bertie O'Hearn once with the, the yellow suit and Barack Obama wore a tan suit once and, and kind of all hell broke loose. But that, that's about all I can remember. So and it, it was just a really interesting uh, conversation to, to have. Yeah. Um, yeah, and if you, I mean, you think of like, I think of like Paul Galvin, you know what I mean? He's always done up to the nines and, you know, he's always very trendy, but that's his, that's his business. Part of his business is, is, is being that, do you know what I mean? Like he, he, he had that. I don't know whether he invests in it or the Coupels brand, do you know what I mean? But, yeah. but yeah, generally, uh, yeah, it, it's, or it's a quick flick over and that's it, you know what I mean? But, but yeah, in terms of criticism or critical mm -hmm. review, it does tend to be a lot towards women but I again I would say it's it's by women and just so remember that your you know your audience is across all genders and none do you know what I mean across all de demographics so again you know to be understated as opposed to overstated. We've covered a lot and I, I'm going to finish maybe with one kind of surprise question maybe to <laughs> I love the surprise question not, right. not so much is but it no, really I, a surprise or is it one that you gave you know, no I think we we, we we did mention it beforehand <laughs> and it's, it's a question I'm asking all of the women that I'm interviewing this week because uh, I'm interested to get the, the different perspective and see how everyone answers it and when I mean, you're an entrepreneur yourself and is there anything that you know now that you wish you'd known at the beginning when you were setting out Oh yeah, sure. Absolutely. And I only realized it this year and I was working with the coach I mentioned, I'll give him a name check, Johnny Holland. Um, he's, he's a great guy. And um, he made me realize, Barry, that I am a perfectionist and I never thought I was a perfectionist. And the reason I never thought I was perfectionist was I thought, well, I never get anything 100% right. And Johnny helped me to realize that nobody gets 100% right and he said and, and yet the perfectionists among us keep going trying for that striving for that wasting too much time on one thing when we should have been moving on to the next do you know what I mean because we're, we're going looking over looking over and so he said probably not his phrase I'm sure he's probably taken 80 to 90 percent is good enough he says 90 percent he started saying 90 percent and then he realized that I was just you know that wasn't enough so he said you 80% is good enough and it was the most powerful thing that anybody has ever taught me and I just I look up to the heavens and I put my hands together like this and I go thank you Johnny you know every day and several times a day because I stop myself and I go what are you doing 80% is fine move on listen Jill that was really interesting and uh, we're going to hear from more entrepreneurs this week tomorrow uh, our interview will be um, with my own sister as it happens Janet O'Carroll who is a local photographer and shoots weddings and does commercial photography she'll be speaking about her experience and in particular about uh, that work-life balance that we discussed earlier um, so make sure tomorrow at 10 o'clock to, to see that one so thank you very much Joe. Thanks Barry it was great as always. Thank you.